Good morning. Hello. Happy Friday. Welcome all of you. I hope this finds you having a great day. Welcome to our live natural health resources. Live Q&A Friday is our live Q&A uh, show, and I'm going to share with you a whole bunch of COVID news. So if you try tuning in this week, I have to apologize. We had some technical issues with the microphone. I am using my wireless mic, so I'm, I'm, I brought out the big boy to hopefully avoid any challenges and to also circumvent if it is a user my side or if it's YouTube error. In the event that we lose audio in 15 minutes or so, which seems to be the average, tune in to Instagram. Uh, it's natural health resources is my handle on Instagram. I, I would encourage you, if you don't follow me on Instagram, please do. I share a whole bunch of other additional news there. So welcome all of you. I am uh, really excited to kick off today's uh, show. First, I want to highlight, if you are not watching the Answer to Cancer free nine-part docu-series, oh my gosh, the lesson last night, um, alternative methods for you and your loved one, lesson three was mind-blowing. And there's still a chance to get in and see this lesson as well as the other five lessons that are coming out. And tonight... Uh, they basically get emailed to you and it's an episode or lesson every evening. And they're very power packed, full of some amazing credentialed uh, resources and professionals. So there's a link down below. Please click on that and get in on this free docu-series. It's really, Scott from Wisconsin actually mentioned, this isn't just about cancer. It's about overall health and wellness, especially during the COVID time. They talk a lot about alternative methods and um, natural resources and therapeutics that you can use to reduce inflammation, to help with the rogue uh, cells that end up being cancerous and growing and multiplying. So it's very interesting, just the information there. So do check that out for Instagram. There'll be a link uh, when this rewraps, I'll post that link. And I've got several questions from you today, and I'll take a lot of live questions. I also have some additional uh, data reports. This is very interesting, some skin-related challenges with COVID. So let's dig in. This, uh, this morning, we're at 4.962 million cases here in the US. We'll be at five uh, over the weekend. And uh, globally, we're gonna be at 19 million today. So we're at 18.986 million, uh, the US will put us probably over the threshold by ourselves. Um, Brazil has 2.917 million. So they'll be hitting 3 million this weekend. And India just surpassed 2 million cases. And Russia is at 877. South Africa is at 538. Africa right now is a big, just the global continent of Africa is a big epicenter. There's 10 countries that are doing the most testing in Africa. So we'll start to see some of their numbers increasing. Mexico surpassed 50,000 fatalities. Um, and I do want to highlight there's been mention and we have to really address the misinformation, false claims and unclear data. Um, there will be no vaccine that will be hitting the market um, by November. So I just want to make that clear. There have been statements that, you know, potentially right at the election time, we'll see vaccine. That just is not the way these things work. Um, and I used to work for a healthcare or a staffing company was in the healthcare world, we had a scientific division that that's all they do, did was staff clinical researchers, epidemiologists, all these different clinicians for clinical trials. Average five to 10 years is the time frame. So the fact we're speeding it up, it's just not it's just not, it's just not feasible, it's not possible, plus the manufacturing issue. So I just want to put that out there. Just really, really don't believe that. Um, so that's my little two cents. Um, some big things that have come out, the IHME, the, um, uh, the Institute for Health Metrics Evaluations, they are run by the University of Wisconsin. They do the epidemiological modeling that kind of shows, okay, based on these characteristics, these, you know, lifestyle choices and kind of activity points of us here in the U.S., they make these modeling predictions as to how many individuals will have COVID and potentially have fat fatalities due to COVID. Their new assessment, given that schools are starting and they're starting to see uh, some major issues with schools, um, the modeling is set in early December. They're expecting we will have 300,000 fatalities here in the U.S. alone, which is pretty crazy. We could reduce that by 66,000 or more 
by simply wearing a mask every time you go outside your house. Very simple, simple. And um, I will tell you today, we're starting something different off with Gabriel. Uh, next week's kind of the like school starting, school is starting for him next week. Today was kind of a trial run. We are starting him off with morning tennis lessons. And so he's going to go and do that in the mornings and it's good, gets his energy out. It's really actually pretty cool out right now with the rain we had. Um, but he's going out with a mask, an extra mask and hand sanitizer and all my natural stuff. So <laughs> he's, he's set. And that's really kind of, we have to be equipped and um, give ourselves all these resources to be safe because we do have to have some semblance of normal life in some way. So um, the one thing that has been predicted um, is that by the end of August, we will also see probably 190,000 fatalities. Our total right now, um, and we are at August 7th, uh, we're at 164,729,000 fatalities. I do want to make a note, and this was in my, my old notebook. You guys know I have like a COVID notebook of notes, and I'm more than halfway through this. Um, in June, they were making predictions about August, and we are kind of close to being on target. The, the one projection, the highest projection in, in August was that we would have 164,000 fatalities by August 8th, tomorrow. So it's a possibility we've been at 1,000 a day. Um, and we had, again, had a thousand uh, plus fatality day yesterday. It's possible we will get very close to that. Um, so with Saturday's numbers, we might be, we might be at that point. And so it does show that the modeling is pretty darn accurate when it comes to predictions, which is very, very disturbing. 300,000 fatalities is crazy. Um, so I also want to kind of dig into some states. Um, California continues to be on the rise. They had over 5,000 new tests, uh, new individuals tested positive. They haven't sorted out their lack of their, their lower reporting number, but they had 166 fatalities. Um, and that is the one consistent number. Fatalities are what they are. And so we, we, there's no way to kind of mess that up unless they may be at a nursing facility or a facility where they've got to get those individuals, those death certificates and, and individuals transferred to like county morgue or whatnot a coroner's office, but fatalities are pretty darn accurate. Um, Florida, the uh, numbers that Florida's at 510. So California is at 529,000, Florida's at 510,000. And they hosted 76, over 7,600 positive cases yesterday, 130 deaths. Texas is definitely reflective of what two, three weeks ago looked like. They posted 7,500 new tests. Uh, new positive cases, and they had 306 fatalities. That is an increase. Um, and the fatalities are going to be uh, remnants of folks that were hospitalized two or three weeks ago who may have been tested a month ago. And so there's this lag time between, you know, transmission to getting a positive test to then being hospitalized to then, you know, going through the stages of severity. Georgia, we're making lots of national headlines with our school starting in Georgia. I'll share some info. Uh, we have more info here. Um, they have, we have 204,000, it was 203, uh, 205,000 uh, positive cases. We posted over 3,100 new positive tests, uh, cases yesterday, 42 fatalities. Um, and what they've seen globally, our tests have, the positive cases have decreased, but there may be some glitchy reporting errors with that. And also people are not wanting to get tested. They don't want to wait for the length of time in line and they also don't wanna wait for the length of time to wait on a test, which is problematic. And I'll share some information as to why that is so detrimental to the spread. The other thing we do, we have seen some fatalities decrease by 2.4%. It's minor, but we'll take a positive. So that's good news. Um, okay, let's talk about some things in the news in the States. Arizona, we have a, um, a jail in Arizona where over half the population, 517 inmates have tested positive with COVID. Um, the inmate population in California is actually, there are, there are early releases happening um, to circumvent the overcrowding. And there are some cases where, you know, marijuana possession, somebody's in jail for two, two years. In Tampa, it's like a $50 fine. I mean, it's just one of those things where it gets a little crazy. 
Um, but I do want to also highlight something that happened yesterday. I believe I reported to you guys, if you heard me on the sound, um, Ohio, the governor tested positive for COVID um, and the president was going to be in Ohio. And so they have this whole kind of process for any of the presidential events where everybody in close proximity has to, or who are going to be hosting him and his group, they have to do tests. Well, they do antigen tests and they are rapid antigens. Now we do know that some of these rapid antigen tests are proving to be inaccurate. And so he tested uh, the day before as positive. Yesterday morning, he had a PCR, which is the traditional, uh, you know, fer the pharynx, uh, you know, the nasal pharynx test, which actually assess the RNA. So there's a big difference between the antigen test and the RNA testing. RNA is obviously more accurate because it shows you actually have viral uh, particulate and the DNA and RNA of the, the, the virus. So in taking that, he tested negative, uh, the governor of, of Ohio. So there's a discrepancy with these tests. And the big question is why? And so, you know, it is, it's just so insane. It's not laughable. And I, I, I laugh because it's just unnerving why are there two different results? And this is possibly remnants of the FDA rushing through and us trying to get all these things out. But it doesn't bode well for us trying to keep our president healthy and safe if the antigen testing is not accurate. Um, and it works both ways. It could be inaccurate for negatives and inaccurate for positives. Um, it's a much better situation to test positive and then really truly test negative that's the best of the outcomes. I will say um, the governor's wife, and I believe his, I think one child or his family were tested, they all tested negative, his staff tested negative. And then come, you know, his PCR test came back negative. So there's going to be some investigation as to why the discrepancies, the antigen versus the PCR. So we'll learn more about that. Um, I have some insane news to share from Florida, Florida, D-U-H. Um, and this comes from my favorite, one of my favorite beaches. I grew up going there. <laughs> so any of you in Pinellas County, Treasure Island Beach, uh, very beautiful beach. They used to do sand castles. They have kite um, contests. And uh, at my friend, I was just on the phone with my friend yesterday. She was heading, she was there over the weekend and she was heading back because she's like, we bought some shirts and we couldn't try them on and they don't fit. So we're returning them. Um so the irony of all this is just so crazy. So there, um, it was later in the evening on Sunday and, you know, at the beach bars, people have alcohol. And so this one gentleman had apparently had too much and was inebriated and went up to a young child who was wearing a mask. Clearly the gentleman was not. And, um, he asked the child to remove his mask and the child was like, you know, I don't know you. <laughs> so no. And the gentleman grabbed the child by his arms and pulled him close and spit on him. And his spit got down the child's face, clearly could have gotten in his eye as well. And we know that particulates, you know, there's aerosolized, but then there's also droplets. Spitting is for sure a droplet transmission point. Um, and the gentleman, the drunkard, <laughs> the drunk beach goer said um, that, we're all good, Brian? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Gabriel's at the tennis courts. Um, so the drunk, so the drunk man said here, now you've got COVID. That's what he told the child. So lo and behold, the gentleman was, um, uh, detained at the restaurant. He tried to hit somebody, uh, from the restaurant that was trying to detain him. The police have arrested him. Um, there are file files that are charged, you know, files charged or charges filed. And um, as far as the, what the authorities know, this happened on Sunday. So today's Friday. Um, as far as they know, the gentleman was not COVID positive, but that is an insane situation. Could you imagine, you know, minding your own business when somebody goes up to your child, a minor and accosts them. And this is, this is assault, you know, this is uh, very much a serious situation. And in some cases, these are, um, you know, felony counts that people are going to be uh, adhering, you know, having having, um, that they're going to be dealing with. So on another crazy front and, you know, there's, I don't even know what to call it here in Georgia, but the one County that's really getting hit hard with a lot of media coverage 
is Gwinnett County. Um, we saw they had uh, teachers gather um, and we had you know over 260 people either positive or exposed to positive carriers. Well, now we have another county um, in Dallas, there was a high school um, students took pictures of this high school. There's a, there's like 2000 kids who go to this high school. It's a massive high school. And it's clear that they have not taken all the right measures to social distance. And this child took a picture, a minor, you know, student in the school took a picture of what the classrooms look like or the, the hallways look like as they were trying to get to the next class. And it was fully jam packed, very reminiscent of those pictures when uh, we were closing our borders and people are getting out of Europe and all sorts of other countries and then jam packed going through customs, coming back into the States at the airports. And um, the uh, child has also recorded and posted on Twitter um, that, you know, out of her seven classes, about 10% of her fellow students were wearing masks. Some, I would, it was low as like four out of 20 uh, were wearing, wearing masks. So one of the things that's happened is she has been, and there was another student that posted, she has been sus suspended uh, for violating the code of conduct of, you know, dispensing pictures of minors. And also um, the school has not been following CDC guidelines. And um, there are some really kind of interesting cases. There's a case out of Tampa, I think I, re I, think I reported about yesterday. I don't remember in the mix of the chaos with our audio, but there was a uh, Tampa teacher who tested positive. He, you know, in the last week, school returning, he told the principal um, and the principal notified the district and they did nothing about it. And they, they, he was told not to tell his fellow teachers and the district had, there was, there was no sort of measurement with the, you know, the time frame, and they have a flow chart of like how they're supposed to notify you know, the district and the, the community at large that has been exposed, teachers didn't find out until they got an email from the fellow teacher who had tested positive that it was out with COVID. Um, so we're seeing some potential breakdown in communication, you know, policies and procedures being really unclear and not transparent. And that is a very risky situation. So those are some things that you, if you have kids and they're at school, you may wanna ask, what are your procedures and processes? What's the time frame, you know, of notifying families and teachers? There's also, um, this is crazy. The, the woman who created Survivor Corps on Facebook is a teacher in the Northeast, in New England. And um, she has found out that um, they do not want her to communicate her story um, about catching COVID and how she was exposed potentially through school. She has been uh, banned from Facebook groups and communicating this. And ultimately the principal is trying to cover up the fact that he didn't tell fellow teachers that she had COVID. So that's just a really insane situation. Um, so just, we will be probably hearing more things about this. Um, now I do wanna highlight Mississippi continues to be a hot spot. Um, there are some hotspot counties. So if you live in Mississippi, I'm going to list off some counties that are showcasing an increase of, um, of, of popu the, the per capita populations increasing with COVID. Uh, Bolivar, Bolivar, I think I'm saying that right. Uh, Coama, Forest, George, Hive, pa um, Panola, Sunflower, and Washington. Those are the counties in Mississippi that are showcasing an increase um, of uh, cases. And that is where they're kind of centralizing the outbreak. Now, therapeutically, this is, um, let's see, we've got some therapeutics. So I've got some data and I want to share with you some therapeutics that are being assessed. So we know there is a clinical trial of remdesivir. Um, and that is a very common drug that they're now dispensing to the hotspots, Florida, California, Texas, um, and Arizona had additional uh, vials of remdesivir to use. Now they're starting to interface other drugs. So one drug that they're starting to enter into the trial as a complementary therapeutic is a, an MS drug called interferon beta 1A, and it's called Rebif. Um, on the market. And it's a, 
this trial is the combination of this interferon with remdesivir. And the interferon, it could help the COVID patient because what they're seeing is the COVID patients that particularly have the major respiratory challenges, they are deficient in the interferon level. And so this may help with the blood, the infection in the blood and the lungs. So the blood clotting and the lung challenges. So that we won't know this, we won't have these results until sometime in mid fall. The other um, complementary drug that they're trying out, it's an RA medication. Um, Illumiant is the over the counter name. And it's a JAK inhibitor, which means it blocks the enzyme that produces um, chemicals that lead to infl inflammation. So this is an in, a lowering of the inflammation levels, trying to deal with the systemic inflammation that they're seeing. And there's a lot of discussion about um, not only is this affecting children in an inflammatory state that it might trigger an in inflammatory state within uh, systemic inflammation within the, the individuals who get the severity of this. Um, so it looks like our audio is doing right. Good, right, friends? Um, let me know if you can still hear me. Okay. So the other thing that um, is very interesting is this new study. This just came out in JAMA, Inter Internal Medicine. I just printed this this morning. Um, and it is titled Clinical Course in Molecular Viral Shedding Among Asymptomatic and Symptomatic Patients with SARS-CoV-2 Infection in a community treatment center in the Republic of Korea. So this is a Korean based um, assessment and they uh, test uh, 303 symptomatic and asymptomatic uh, carriers of COVID between March 6th and March 26th. And the question is, was there, or is there a viral load difference between the asymptomatic and symptomatic patients who have SARS, or, you know, SARS-CoV-2? The finding is that of the 303 patients who were infected in this community treatment center, 110, 36 were asymptomatic at the time of isolation, and 21 of those developed symptoms during isolation. So of the 36, 19% developed symptoms. And there was a, a cycle threshold um, in the asymptomatic cases, very similar to the symptomatic cases. So they basically show this particular um, uh, transpolymerase chain uh, transition or transfer. This reaction was the same as they show in the symptomatic cases. So asymptomatic can present with symptoms or not and still be as potent within the body as uh, a symptomatic carrier. And what they found in this, what that means is that um, the infection remained, you know, individuals who were asymptomatic uh, for a prolonged period of time, their viral load was the same as the symptomatic patients. So isolation of infected patients should be performed regardless of the symptoms. So if you test positive, now this might skew this whole CDC's, you know, if you test positive, um, you know, go home until you stop showing symptoms or you have a 10 day time frame, and then you go back to work. This might blow that all out of the water. So I'm curious to see what's going to happen with that. But this is back in March and we're, you know, it's now August. And so this is sometimes how long things take for us to, you know, get an, an understanding, assess what all has happened. Um, and they've got a whole bunch of charts. They've got, you know, the difference in the male, female, the age group, the days of diagnosis. The one thing that I found, I actually want to highlight, um, they, the result on this, it said that the median range of our interval of time from detection of COVID uh, to symptomatic onset and pre-symptomatic patients was 15 uh, days. And that could be on average, it was a range of 13 to 20. So 15 is the average, um, which is very interesting because if somebody has an onset, they've got potentially two weeks that they they're if they're not quarantining, if they've been exposed and with contact tracing being so limited, we don't know, they may be spreading this just like wildfire. So this is really kind of interesting. Now, the other report that came out, this is a research letter. So it's not as substantial as like a clinical trial, but we've got some really interesting images. So 
Um, and I'm seeing this also in the um, COVID survivor, the survivor corpse group. Um, this is a uh, uh, livadoid and pur purpuric <laughs> skin eruptions associated with coagulative uh, or uh, coagulopathy. So uh, blood clotting, like micro clotting in severe COVID-19. So what that means is there's a particular type of um, skin condition and, it's, and I'll talk about this. I'll go into this tomorrow way more, but there's a skin condition where people get kind of red rashes. And this one gentleman posted, he's, he was developing this up here and people get it all over the body. You know, COVID toes are an example of this and this we're seeing this on the, the bottom, the ball of the foot and underneath the big toe. But this is indicative of um, the pathology of this is that there is some thrombotic elements where there is micro blood clotting that is causing uh, blood flow challenges. And it's a buildup, um, a very abnormal type of blood clotting that's been showcasing redness of the skin. Um, and it shows on the uh, hands, forearms. Um, they also, some of these folks that had that, they had arterial and venous thrombosis. Some had just arterial thrombosis and some just had venous or a combination. So this is a, an inkling into what is going on that's greater within the body. Tomorrow, my show is going to be on that. We're going to talk about skin conditions. And I'm also going to talk about how to remedy this topically and internally not remedy, but to, to treat that symptom because the symptom is a much deeper situation. So um, the other thing that I wanna highlight is based on this, King's College a few weeks ago had a study on the skin. I highlighted it to all of you. If you watched me that day and it showed that 8.8% of positive cases showcase skin reactions, um, some skin reaction or rash. Now, what's crazy is 21% in the study, the skin rash was the only symptom they experienced. So while they didn't experience the you know, shortness of breath and all these other issues, they, they experienced that. Okay, so friends, I wanna go to your questions. So I've got my first set of questions here from Instagram and YouTube, feel free to ask questions and I'll go through the live chat. Um, Andrea Barton one asked on Instagram recently stopped smoking and dealing with extreme heartburn, taking aloe cure, but need more. Um, so I'm assuming your question is how do you deal with the heartburn? Um, so one of the things that is going to be really critical is you'd want to look at doing a lung detox. If you've given up smoking, I actually love to do a castor oil pack of your lungs. That's a really good way to kind of help clear out the junk and gunk of the lungs. There's also some really good herbal blends. I like, um, I like incorporating um, a, a lot, a good variety of, of herbals. Um, and you can actually Google and you can check out my full script store if you're interested, but we have a lung assortment of lung detox products. Some are herbal, um, like Chinese therapies, and then there are homeopathic lung detox. So definitely check that out. Professional formulas is one that has some really good lung related um, homeopathics, but the um, heartburn might just be some of the detoxification that's happening. The other thing that you might be experiencing is you've always probably had that, but you might not have noticed it because of the smoking. It just kind of minimized that. And so um, you know, esophageal damage can occur with smoking. You know, there's the, the actual toxins, you get this, the smoke and, um, that can damage the mucosal lining. So you want to take care of your mu mucosal lining, limit dairy, limit the gluten and really address the inflammation. Okay. So my other question came from grand design, two questions. One, um, what do I recommend for IBSD? And um, that's, um, you know, inflammatory bowel disease. So everybody's uh, IBS presents differently. And it really has to be an individual case because everybody has an individual microbiota. Um, there are ways to test your microbiota to figure out do you have imbalances in some of the unhealthy bacteria, which, you know, we need a balance. So there's good and bad, we need the balance of it. So you don't want to eradicate all your bad, but you don't want them to be overwhelmed. And when they're not kept in check by the good, that's when we get imbalances. So you can present 
it with diarrhea for a few weeks and then constipation, you know, cramping, gas, bloating, all of those things can get mashed up together in a period of time. But your gut microbiota is really critical to take care of and adhere to. You can add in things like um, really good high, heavy, large gram or large strain probiotics. Um, one of my favorites you can find in full script. It's um, let's see, it is, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it's a red, red box and it's a garden of life max. Um, and it has 34, 35 strains. It's a powder. You can mix it in anything, you know, a nut yogurt, a smoothie. Um, and it's very potent. So I, I like to really incorporate that. I also like to um, support your liver because the bile can really be cleansing. So dandelion milk thistle are very helpful. Okay, Grand Designs, other question, low T and hormonal women. So low testosterone is often um, a caused, it's often caused by low cortisol levels, or not low cortisol, sorry, high cortisol. So if you have high cortisol, that is usually indicative of the fact that you have a lot of stress within your body. And you know, it's COVID stress is what it is. That's just putting everybody kind of over the edge. But more than more likely, you've had some degree of stress, there's biochemical, there's physical, there's mental, there's emotional, uh, there's all sorts of stressors we're dealing with. They can all cause uh, it, an increase in your cortisol. When you are increased, when you see cortisol is increasing, that level throughout the day, or depending on when you, you know, when your levels are the highest, your body actually leaches progesterone and testosterone. It takes those compounds and steals from the compounds that build progesterone, ester, uh, progesterone and testosterone, and makes cortisol. So cortisol often is the antithesis of testosterone. And it could be a reason why you have low T. So that is the number one, because it doesn't matter if you're taking an herb, you know, to balance your testosterone, you need to address the cortisol that's leaching the, the, the make the, the ingredients of testosterone. So that's number one. Okay. Uh, I saw some questions over here. Let's see. Um, super facial. Uh, okay. So I did that. Okay. So I answered those currently taking DHEA. Okay. So if you're taking, oh yeah. So she's also taking DHEA. Oh, I don't know if that's super facial or it might be the same account, but okay. So if you have high DHEA, um, you can have high DHEA and low testosterone, or you can have high DHEA and high testosterone. Sometimes you can get the two that is an adrenal issue. And so addressing your cortisol is going to be critical. Um, the DHEA levels, if they're too high, take zinc. Zinc is the way to offset uh, high DHEA. Super easy. Um, one more. Would you agree to be maskless with someone who did have symptom-free COVID, but who has now tested negative twice? No. Mm -mm. No, I, it's too risky. We know that they are contagious and have viral particulates for up to and over 58 days. Uh, so no, I think there is no, we are still, we, we are still learning about this virus. We don't know hundred percent of it. And if you're willing to take that risk, that's on you. But would I do it? No, I am, I am low risk on this. I tend to be risky sometimes. And, you know, choices that I make about, you know, business and other things, but not low and not risky, but you know, like calculator risks, that is a calculated risk I'm not taking <laughs> and our family's not taking. We just, it's not worth it. Um, so especially when I see images um, on their survivor corpse, I don't know where it was, but you know, a mom of a four-year-old child was fine. She had COVID tested positive, had fever, boom, went downhill. She's on a ventilator. That is not going to, that is no, that's not happening here. Um, I, I'm not equipped to handle that type of, uh, health crisis with my child. Um, but again, everybody's different and you have to make a choice that you feel comfortable with. For me, I don't feel comfortable with that because I also know the data and I know one, we don't know everything. And two, you know, we're, we've learned slowly that this is aerosolized. We learned more about the RNA, you know, people in the survivor corps are, are remaining to test positive for weeks, six, seven, eight, 10, 12 weeks. Um, and they're not recovering. And we also know there's the fecal oral transfer. 
Okay. So sorry, I didn't want to be too bold with that, but that's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm low risk on my health, you know, on my health. And I think to you now having a child, it's a totally different situation. We have a lot to lose. We all do. Even if you don't have children, you know, your life is precious and we're all here for a purpose, whatever that is, maybe you haven't found it, but you know, choose wisely and choose lifestyle choices, choose diet choices, choose medical providers, choose, you know, activities that support and enhance that versus take away from it. That's my philosophy. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, oh, Jenny's buffering. Hopefully you guys aren't buffering. Um, okay. Tracy said, I was reading this morning about the two tests and what it means. Very interesting and frustrating. Yeah. That's a very crazy. Um, okay. I see you guys freaking out about the Florida. <laughs> it's crazy. Okay. Um, Emily says, so the student gets in trouble for talking and sharing pics, but nothing happens to school. Correct. Uh, and you know, you're not also, you're not, what, what's crazy about this is you're not supporting the child and their own concern for their health. You're basically minimizing that child's concern. And you know what children, especially now social media is how they get the word out. And it's very, you know, it went viral and they're pissed that it went viral, um, but it went viral for effect. And that was what was hoped to, you know, the, the hope to achieve that. Now we need to see the virility of that move into policy changes and some action by our local government and maybe our governor here in Georgia. And that does not seem to be uh, something that we're going to take. Uh, what does castor oil do? It's just an oil. Okay. So it's not just an oil. It is amazing. It is a particular type of fat, um, that, uh, has a molecular density and that is where castor oil is really powerful. So it's from uh, rapeseed is the name of the seed we get it from. Um, people do often ingest it. Not a whole lot. I don't recommend that it can clear people out, but it's very toxic and needs to be supervised. So it's, this is a topical oil only, but it has an amazing ability to, the molecular density infuses this oil through the dermal layer and gets into soft tissue, muscle, and organ tissue. And it creates detoxification. It can, uh, and I know about this as a lymphatic therapist, it'll motivate your lymphatics. So if you have stagnancy and glands, if you have swollen glands, if you've got, you know, some sort of lymphatic challenge, doing castor oil packing is very potent. If you have liver toxicity, it'll clear out um, and help detox your liver. Um, if you haven't done it before, test it out on your abdomen. We can do that on the breast tissue. I have a whole course, breast related course, breast care course. It's 26 video and audio lessons, very detailed, very descriptive of how to do this and a whole bunch of other things to heal dense breast tissue. It is a, it's a miracle worker um, for women who, who have PCOS and cystic activity, you know, from cysts on bones, it's, it's extremely powerful. So um, it has the molecular density also allows us to drive nutrient properties from oils like frankincense and other oils, magnesium into the body and to motivate it. Um, Alice Green says, I'm afraid for my grandchildren. I know, um, you know, we're definitely trying, we're figuring things out here uh, in Georgia, unfortunately, at the risk of kids. Um, okay, so let's see. Question, Emily, I tested positive from the MTHR gene mutation. I've been prescribed L... Uh, methylfolate, 15 milligrams. Will taking this help me to do detoxing and do castor oil packs without getting sick? Um, I, it depends. I'm hoping they also tested your folic acid levels. That would be really great if they gave you an idea of how deficient you were in folic acid and B12. Um, you may want to get a few weeks behind you and taking it on a daily basis. Um, the MTHFR affects people differently. The methylation challenge, um, it, a lot of it has to do with metabolic uh, detoxification. Now, the good part is castor oil will move the lymphatics. So lymph is not necessarily a metabolic detox process, but it is a part of our detoxification process. And one of the things that you have to do, if you want to promote health and wellness, you need to move, motivate your lymphatics. 
And there's nothing like a pump mechanism, like a heart that's moving the blood through the body. Nothing pumps the, the, the lymph. We get muscle engagement, you know, like when we're exercising and moving around, that engages the lymphatics, but sometimes we need manual engagement. Um, and in the world of castor oil pack, that can be a manual process. Um, so I would, I'd experiment and I would do like, if you try it, do a little bit, like do five minutes and see how you do. I wouldn't do, you know, like I'll do sometimes do 30 to an hour, depending. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Golden reach. So dogs can get IBS as well. Part of it's their diet. Um, and also a lot of times their diet doesn't give them organ meats and like we give our dogs, um, now I haven't had it in a while, um, but a lot of times I can get frozen tripe and it's a special treat. Oh my gosh, it's really rich in enzymes and probiotics. I gave that to my, the first puppy I got, Mizuki. She had parvo like a week after I got her and um, nearly died, but that definitely helped. We used herbs. I did all therapeutic, natural therapeutics for her. Um, all right, cupcake paper, is Diflucan dangerous and what are natural options for yeast infections? So the first thing, I'm not a big fan of Diflucan, uh, rule out that it is indeed a yeast infection versus a bacterial infection. You know, so there's, there's yeast, true yeast, candida, and then there's like bacteria um, that can be different than the yeast. So not all yeast infections are the same, you have know, the same property. So that would be one. Um, there are like um, boric acid uh, suppositories are very potent. I think that's probably your best solution. And then also addressing the microbiota. Why do you keep having those? Or why are those occurring? Why has it occurred? What imbalance is at play? If you have had antibiotics, you want to make sure that you're taking a lot of probiotics, a lot of varieties of probiotics, different versions, you know, kefir base, maybe it's non-dairy, um, and get food based probiotics and prebiotics. So those can all help balance that. Uh, let's see in harmony gal, what are some recommendations for treating rosacea? So definitely cut the spices. It's an inflammatory related situation. Sometimes the harshness of your skincare. So I have Aaliyah is my go-to for online, uh, purchasing of, um, skincare products and I'll, I'll post a link to them. Um, and also, um, my friend Rachel infuses C bumblebee D that, uh, herbal, uh, mix. She infuses that into skincare, skincare serums, and that is really potent. So that'll get rid of the redness. I tend to get like a little inflamed, especially like when I work out, I'll get red. That tends to be a family thing. Uh, and Gabriel unfortunately has that too. Um, oh, thanks Linda. This is actually, I think I got this at like a garage sale. I love, I love saving money on clothing. Okay. Um, Lori feeds her pup a raw diet. Yeah, really good. Tripe, tripe is really good. Um, and pumpkin is great for puppies. Um, ours will eat anything and everything. <laughs> we've had them eat all sorts of things. So we've, we are frequent flyers at the vet. We have a vet multi pet discount at our vet. It's that bad. Um, okay. So let's see. Um, well, licorice lower cortisol. Um, so licorice is one of those things where, uh, it depends on your situation. If you have high blood pressure, you want to, you want to totally avoid licorice. It can elevate, um, your, your blood pressure. The other thing that is often at play with, um, cortisol, if you have low cortisol, like some people have really low blood pressure, like their adrenals just are not, they've got the adrenal dysfunction on the other side where they're not revving up, they're just not producing enough cortisol, they need licorice, that'll like, it, it'll, it'll get their court, the cortisol kicking, it'll, it'll pump up those adrenals and get them activated. Um, so we use it more so when people are low than high, I use other compounds when people are high. Um, data bug. Thanks for the informative videos. How do we remove stomach mucus? So first eliminate possible sources of irritation. Mucus in the stomach is going to be indicative of inflammation. Um, it could very well be uh, also indicative of maybe um, a bacterial imbalance or infection. 
of the stomach lining. Mucus is being produced for some reason. Um, biofilm redu reduction is also critical. Um, there are a few in full script that I really love the biofilm reducers. I'm not, I can't remember their names off the top of my head, but they're very potent. Um, so that would be something. Uh, let's see. Taryn, I've had a coworker tested two times negative with symptoms. Third, the charm was positive. This is crazy. Yeah. So I've got a friend right now in Texas who is showcasing very classic COVID related symptoms and has only tested one time is negative. Um, and my concern is what test did she take? If you take the antigen, I mean, the evidence in Ohio is not positive for these antigen tests. And those are those rapid tests. And there's been a lot of documentation that we, we push these through too fast with the FDA without really challenging and, and requiring efficacy that, you know, if you're going to take a test and gosh, you know, could you imagine standing in line three or four hours and then you get up there and it's not even an accurate test? What? That's just insane. Um, and the frustration that people feel, that's why people, the numbers are lower. People don't want to do testing. They don't want to wait in line or wait for the time frame to come back. And then now we have this undercurrent of how accurate are they? Um, what do I, DDJ2, what do you recommend for a person who has dementia and suffers from sundown? Um, so with dementia, and there's all different types of, you know, there's dementia is not a single diagnosis. Like there's a lot of things at play. Um, if it's a diabetic, I would want to address the diabetes, the pancreas. So like yesterday's video, which you can see the full video on Instagram TV, I talk about ways to address diabetes, uh, supplementation, things to, to, to manage that. So that's one that those go hand in hand. So diabetes will often yield, you know, the vascular impairments of the brain. Um, but there are different types of dementia and herbs, acupuncture, acupressure, certain um, uh, balancing of neurotransmitters can be potent. But at the end of the day, the brain is, is fat and water. So you want to make sure people are hydrated properly, have all the right electrolytes and are getting healthy fats. Healthy fats are very potent in not just balancing the blood sugar and very supportive of removing um, possible blockages of vascular channels to the brain. Um, so that's one that's there's a lot to that question. I, I don't know the specifics, you know, of what you're you're, you're asking what might be the underlying cause, but dementia is something that we want to be preventative um, more so. So when an individual gets it, it's now we want to keep the brain as healthy as possible without the reduction. And, and, you know, some of the things that we have seen, there's some data um, stem cell um, transplants are helpful. And that that's like a topic that uh, is, is less talked about in the medical community, but we are seeing it in, you know, clinics that do that type of work. We see some neuro balancing that comes from that, but like Dr. Um, Amen is a really good resource. He uh, does all the MRIs and CT scans of the brain. And he's, he was, a lot of his work was instrumental in the NFL player issues of like all the brain related damage uh, from sports injuries. Um, you know, one concussion could be the source of dementia down the road. Um, and so, you know, he looks at eating for the brain. And I really support that he truly is amazing. I've gone to um, seminars where he's lectured us about, you know, the latest research and things. But again, eating for the brain, it's, you know, healthy fats, omegas, plant based, low inflammation, you know, the same type of healthy diet for your liver and your ovaries or testes is the same that you want for your brain. So just globally, lowering your inflammation level is going to be good for your brain. Okay, Hector, what are the pros and cons of taking castor oil internally? Why was it used in early medical history? So um, it was used in early medical history to uh, move the bowels. And so it was a good a solution for constipation. Too much is toxic and can kill people. So, um, you know, that's why it's not advisable internally. You want to make sure if you do do it, you do it under the, the, under the direction of a medical provider. I won't ever recommend that to any of you watching. It's just not, it's not safe 
But, you know, in, in externally, they used it for a lot of different reasons. Um, it treats arthritis, it treats pain, it treats inflammation, swelling, very powerful. Oh, let's see, Nina. Oh, you went out to the new pier. So in St. Pete, there are quite a lot of people out. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of friends posting pictures. 95% of the people out had no masks on. Yeah, it's crazy. I think it's an assumption that you're outside, you don't need them, but you still do if you're going to be around people. Again, the aerosolized uh, nature. Um, okay, data bug. I had a partial hysterectomy a year ago. Now my weight has been stuck. Any tips at what I should look at? Um, cortisol, start there. Uh, partial hysterectomy, depending on what you're dealing with that caused the partial hysterectomy, could very well be the underlying component of why you needed it, you know, i.e. you have um, potentially imbalances in estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. Those all lead back to cortisol imbalances that may have caused, um, you know, endometrial lining to be imbalanced or you had fibroids. Um, so that's one issue. The other thing, um, you know, with weight, weight is all about, you um, you know, there's a lot of different elements at play with weight. Weight is cortisol oriented. Weight is also about getting the right nutrient density. So making sure you're getting multi-minerals in your diet, um, as well as helping lower your inflammation levels are going to help turn off those triggers. Like we will get, we get turned on or off in terms of do we hold weight because we're in a stressed out state. And for a lot of women, it's in the, the midsection because that's where we're protecting our core reproductive organs and our organs that keep us alive. Um, let's see. Um, let's see, I've got more questions. Okay, so Jimmy said, asks, what does freezing do when a doctor freezes rough spots on a person's skin? So basically, they're just removing the layer. It's probably some squamous cells or some sort of abnormal cell tissue. And like, my, oh gosh, my grandma, and now my aunt, my, my older cousin, I call her an aunt, she's got all of those things happening, or she, she'll get like all these things frozen off of her ear. Um, it basically is, you know, on the Skin, the surface layer of the skin, you've got cells that aren't turning over fast enough. And cellular changes will often in, be indicative of potentially precancerous cells. So cell turnover is really critical. And on the skin, you know, when they're kind of looking at like arms, areas that where you've had sun damage, there will be like little kind of spots that, um, it, you know, if you're trained in it, you can see there, a lot of it's visible. Um, but they'll just, you know, burn off that spot. So it's a preventative cancer prevention technique. Um, you know, do they give you any ways to change that? You know, no, but you can do other things topically to help um, enhance that. I would put some neem salve on those areas. Neem is really good for the skin. Um, okay, Vicki asks, I take six fat soluble supplements a day. Do I have to eat something every time? Depends on which ones you're taking. Generally, like I like to have food in my tummy when I take a fish oil, an omega. I, it's just something that I've learned to do. Um, I don't remember who told me that in school, but it, I, just, I just do that. Um, it just, I feel like it helps me digest it. Um, let's see, Lori says, I'm so mad at all the tourists here in the Finger Lakes, New York. Why can't people stay home? It's very stressful having to clean Airbnb places. She's using force in nature. She loves it. Um, yeah, it is. I definitely do. I think we're, we're getting a threat. I mean, I'm feeling it. We're getting a threshold where like, we're sick and tired of being in this situation and people let their guards down and they're like, screw it. You know, I don't care. And then there's also the stress. So one of the things the psychology of stress is denial you know, lack of really wanting to address how severe it is. Um, and it doesn't excuse that behavior, but I hope that kind of explains some of it. It's very frustrating. Uh, we comment on that all the time here in our household. Um, yay, Queen of Sheba bought ghee. Love ghee, ghee is good. Ghee is good. It's very good, brain supportive. Ghee is great. Ghee is good for your heart. It's good for your vascular channels. It's good healthy fat. 
Karen is affirming, love doing castor oil packets, game changer. Um, Amen, yeah, Amen is awesome. Um, let's see, Taryn, I had to take castor oil as a child. My mother was so mean to give that to me. Yeah, I would not want to, I would not want to take that. Um, I, you know, I, I haven't taken it, but I have done some of those crazy, like gallbladder clearing cleanses, you know, where you're drinking, uh, oh, geez, it's like salt water, saline water, and then you drink a uh, grapefruit juice or some sort of acid. Ugh, it is intense. And I believe that that's pretty much the same kind of experience people have. Um, okay. Emily, why do you, whoa, geez. This is really good. What do you suggest for getting rid of a Buffalo bump or hump? Okay. So, um, that is, um, what is the name of that? I actually have a little bit of a, Oh, Daisy wants to come say hi. Come here, Daisy. Come here, pup. Come here. I'm wearing white, white pants today. So hopefully her paws are you going to pause clean. I want to say hi to everybody. Oh, she's such a good girl. Isn't she such a good girl? Here, come see the Instagram. Can't see you. Hi. Are you being good? Are you being good? She's hunting chipmunks in our yard. Are you hunting chipmunks? So um, this is exciting. A little note on our yard. Brian was outside. I have um, hummingbird gardens basically all over the yard. Like we have sides in the back of the yard. And it's one plant. So if you guys are interested in attracting hummingbirds, black salvia is like the best plant to plant. They love it. And it's this dark purple blue. It actually is kind of like this color, uh, purple. And um, we have, I mean, we have hummers and like, and we're at the peak where they start like dive bombing us and each other they get really territorial. But Brian saw a baby. It was, he said it was this big yesterday morning. So I'm awaiting, I want to see the baby. They're very routine in terms of their eating schedule. So hopefully we'll see her today. Um, okay. So yeah, so Daisy's my sweetheart. Um, oh, Buffalo hump. Okay. So, um, what is the name of it? I can't remember the clinical name, but I've done their physical therapy. There are some really good, um, therapeutic, like physical therapy. What you want to do is you want to in increase the strength of the back. Um, and so it's an imbalance between the front of the body and the back of the body and literally, um, strengthening up all of the muscles. So a lot of it has to do with different techniques. Foam rolling has been the game changer. Um, I have more spinal flexibility and then uh, rows and different exercises. And I worked with a physical therapist that now I do these exercises at home. I'm not as religious about it, but I definitely do feel a difference when I'm not doing those. Uh, but it definitely helps that that back. A lot of times scoliosis is a factor. So everybody kind of prevents um, in, uh, oh, it's called kyphosis. So kyphosis is where you have an imbalance in the muscles. So a lot of times the pec muscles will be tighter. So you need to open, extend these, elongate, doing stretches, um, you know, in a doorway, literally like this. And then, you know, so you're holding onto the doorway and then you're pressing your whole body forward. Very, very uh, beneficial. So uh, love, love that. And it feels good. Um, and there's also some emotional stuff. So sometimes if you're protecting your heart, you're closed in, you need to address those emotions because you know, where the mind goes, the body, where the mind is, the body follows, um, to do what product lowers cortisol. Um, there are a lot of different products, depending on how high your cortisol is. There are some plant-based compounds. Um, I have, uh, Reloraplex is my favorite in Reloraplex and cortisol reducer by, um, Vitanica. Those are both in full script if you want to check those out. Okay. So we got a minute on Instagram and I'm so excited. My audio, I totally fixed it. So I've got, I've got I'm literally all hardwired in. Okay. So Hector, uh, what do you think of borax? Some people will dilute it to consume. I don't, I wouldn't consume it, but I mentioned it's really good for yeast infections. Um, it's also a very good way to get rid of ants and insects in your house. That's very natural. Um, let's see, how can you restore mucosal lining in the nose, throat and stomach have LPR silent reflux damage. Okay. Um, that's a longer question. Okay. Oh, you know what? Instagram, I've got to run. 
because we're at 20, 20 seconds and I don't want it to cut without me saving. So join me on, on YouTube. I'm going to keep answering questions. All right, friends. Thanks for tuning in. Happy Friday. Okay. So let me just save this. Let me post this really fast to uh, Instagram so that Instagram TV can watch this. And um, let me add it to the series. Okay. So T okay. So teach Emerson. So the question I have on that is, um, do you still have the reflux? Uh, because it doesn't matter what you do to the lining, you have to get rid of the reflux first. So some of that is you need to rule out H pylori, rule out any other bacteria uh, elements that might be at play. The other thing there in the lining of the nose and the throat, I just love, I love saline, grapeseed, you know, sprays. There's also a good homeopathic spray that can be beneficial. Um, and then also restoring your gut microbiota. We have a microbiota of the sinuses, so the, it will follow follow suit. You restore your gut, you're going to notice your microbiota throughout your whole entire body really benefit from that. Um, okay. So Denise says, I've been feeling a weakness in my stomach every afternoon. It subsides and I feel stronger hours later, curious as to what could cause this. Hmm. I don't know. I mean that the weakness in your stomach and is it the stomach or is it another organ? Um, cause there, there's a lot going on in that space. Um, Okay. So friends, I've got to run. Gabriel's coming back from tennis. I haven't seen, I don't know if he's walking up, but I've got to run. I got to get ready for him. Um, but thank you guys for tuning in today. I'm so grateful. Check the notes. I'll add some of the things we talked about. Um, I made notes of some of the, the supplements that we want. I've, I've highlighted that you can check out. Um, so I'll include some more additional links and I'm so grateful. Yay. Our audio worked. I'm so happy. So tune in tomorrow. We're going to talk about more skin this particular type of skin reaction, um, because that's something people wouldn't think that that's COVID, but it is. So, and I'll have some other ways to address skin. All right. Thanks friends for tuning in. Have a great day. Bye everybody.